for the next game. Karpov's pass key. d4, knight f6, d4, e6, knight f3. Uh, they started this game as Nimzo Indian. It would have been Nimzo Indian if white played third move, knight c3. And uh, yeah, it would be Nimzo Indian if he played knight c3, but it's not. So look what how complicated chess could be. So uh, he didn't play the knight c3. This is classical Nimzo Indian. If they played bishop b4, it's all about fighting over e4. But another thing is d5. And uh, d5 is just transposing to Queen's Gambit orthodox. Queen's Gambit declined. Queen's Gambit exchanged. And uh, these kinds of positions. Uh, no, this guy didn't play knight c3. Karpov played knight f3. Now, all of a sudden, we have queen's indian d. And look, uh, once again, how complicated things are. Uh, if b6, it's a typical queen's indian d. If they play c5 after d5, it's Benoni defense. If they play knight c3, it's English opening. And if they play d5, what Karpov's opponent did in this game, we're once again getting back into the world of the Queen's Gambit Orthodox type of game. This is very, very interesting, and I'm just showing you complexity of the openings. I uh, just want to tell you one thing, speaking of the openings, because I told you that we're going to do like one lesson during the week on middle games and another lesson will be on theoretical uh, topics and positions i'd like to point out one thing i've been i've been uh, watching some streams about uh, you know some uh, openings i've been watching some weeds about openings and you know what i've noticed people are usually are usually uh, not fully satisfied with these opening lessons because if I try uh, to make these opening stuff for like higher levels, uh, lower levels will say we don't understand like 50% of the things what happened here and uh, they're not going to like it. They're, they're going to keep whining about those. If I try to perform those lessons for like lower levels, uh, WGF3, thank you for your donation. Uh, as Brad Theme appreciate that. Uh, and from another point of view, if I try to adjust these lessons for like low low rated guys or like for medium levels or lower rated guys, then these strong ones complain uh, why the hell this guy didn't explain uh, you know like more difficult stuff going deeper uh, and going for like more complicated stuff this is interesting this is interesting and i'll try to do mix of both so good ones to be satisfied and bad ones or just beginners or just medium levels just all of you uh trying to satisfy somehow not easy let's go now uh wgf3 thanks 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 so let's carry on after d5 Mm, Karpov played knight c3. Look, once again, the uh, complexity of uh, chess. If he goes c5, Tarash opening. If he takes on c4, Vienna opening. If they go bishop b4, Raga's in line. If they play uh, c6, it can go to different kind of systems, well, even though... Uh, we could play uh, bishop g5 after e3, it's Meran defense. Bishop g5, it's Botwinic system against the Slav. So many complicated stuff. In this game, Karp uh, Karpov's opponent played bishop e7, and Karpov, uh, you know, at this moment, what has. Thanks for the lessons, Mio. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, thanks for the lessons. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, for doing this. Uh, after bishop e7, white has two main possibilities. Bishop g5, 
which is typical Queen's Gambit Orthodox type of the game, and Bishop F4. This guy went for Bishop F4. Uh, lately, uh, on top levels and in top, you know, in like uh, top arenas and all these uh, strongest tournaments, uh, we started to see this move more and more often. Uh, Carlsen nowadays does that. Uh, all these top guys like Caronian, Caruana, uh, Grishchuk, everybody goes for the bishop f4 lately and it's like very, very popular. Uh, after bishop f4, castles, e3, c5. Uh, I'm just moving uh, throughout this sequence of moves a little bit faster because I want to show you this type of game. Queen c2, queen a5, a3, bishop c5, and Nowadays, you have some guys who would play here long castle and go for a crazy knight g5. For example, I wouldn't hesitate to go with a crazy long castle and uh, maybe organize my attack playing the knight g5, threatening some nasty stuff like c takes d5, rook d5, or c takes d5, knight d5. Uh, but th that's not Karpov. That's not his style and he was learning from the best. And uh, thank you, Anonymous, for your uh, donation as well. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, okay, so look at this one. Karpov style, uh, Karpov style is not to play uh, long castle, is not to attack, is not to go for any tactics. This is, uh, this is a great example uh, to show you what the chess style is. For example, in similar type of situations, Kaspar would always go for long castle going for mate. Karpov, on the contrary, would never go for that move and he would always go for a move like uh, for a move like uh, rook to d1 followed by knight g5 or just going and against the potentially weak d5 pawn. This is nice. This is nice. And uh, this, is the, this is the difference between styles of a chess players, even top ones. So even top players would never play uh, the same moves here. Somebody would play long castle, somebody would play rook to d1, and there are guys uh, who wouldn't do any of this. They would just play bishop e2 followed by, for example, short castle. This is the difference between top GMs. We all have our own style and we just have to go for that so guys if you like to play sharp uh, try to sharpen your knife and butcher your opponents even more tactically if you're trying to play positional try to analyze Karpov's, Botwinik's, Mislos, Petrosian's uh, nowadays Carlsen's uh, games and try to play uh, more positionally and of course try to fit your openings in those so let's carry on now. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Ugly as. I, I, I cannot say the rest of your name. There must be a balance between frequency of donations. I absolutely agree. So after a rook to d1, uh, he's not only focusing on d5 pawn, he's also controlling the d4. So he's not allowing this guy to push this pawn up to d4, exchanging this pawn and doing things like this. So that's why he played rook to d1, bishop e7. Uh, oh, and by the way, he's now threatening to play b4. For all of you who wondered, could he play and do a fork? No, he couldn't, because after bishop to b4, this one, a rook would be hanging and uh, black would win a game on the spot. So all together with pressuring the d5 pawn, with preventing the d4, on the top of all this, he's even threatening to play some b4. That's why Spassky played bishop to e7. And after bishop e7, Karpov is doing extremely tough positional move knight d2. Not many players would play this. Uh, first of all, he's closing the diagonal by this queen on a5. Second thing, he's controlling and uh, better defending the pawn on c4. Third thing, uh, he's just 
uh, he's just covering better uh, e4 square and stopping knight e4 by black. And for a thing, uh, he may go at some point with some b4 ideas, but uh, I'm just saying in case this queen moves, otherwise if b4 now, queen would take on a3 and the pawn b4 would be hanging. So knight e2 was nice move, and black played bishop d7. In this very popular line, and fashionable, fashionable lately, there is an interesting line e5. And after bishop g5, d4, and after knight b3, this is another idea behind this knight on b3, uh, chasing the queen away and uh, uh, putting some pressure on the d4 pawn. Bishop e2, a5, and uh, we have a very interesting position uh, with mutual uh, chances. Uh, after the games, after the moves from the game, you're gonna see that uh, Pasky, that's the guy who played with the black pieces. So this was a clash of titans, uh, Carpa with white pieces in the extremely positional line against uh, Pasky, uh, who was very, very aggressive guy. Actually, he gave Carpa a couple of chances in this game to complicate the matters and to play very tactically, but of course Karpov didn't fall for that and he all the times just forcing the very positional options. Okay, so after, after in uh, this position they went for uh, this variation, uh, knight d2, bishop d7, it was a very suspicious move. Um, in my opinion, e5, uh, was screaming to be played there, and uh, oh, bishop d7 looks very, very inactive. Very weird because Pasky was very uh, active player, and he likes uh, he liked to sacrifice a lot. Anyways, after rook f c8, castles and queen to d8. Uh, this is even though this book also mentions. Bishop d7, rook c8, and queen d8 as sort of suspicious plan. I like this maneuvering by black. I like this as a part of a plan. So sometimes you can maneuver with your pieces like this. Quite a nice as a plan and as an idea in some of these positions. Uh, I just have to welcome uh, Black Albino, our good friend uh, and my big fan. Uh, okay. One guy asked me, the guys from Serbia, should he subscribe or to buy something to it, some sort of national uh, food in Serbia. So definitely, Kupi Triburica. So after like Rook C8 and Queen D8, uh, Black at first glance looks good. Uh, but let's have a look what is Karpov going to do. Uh, and this is the first time, uh, you know, in this game that I'm going to stop here and ask you for your plans. So once again, I'm not asking you for a move. I'm asking you for a plan. Let's go. Let's go. I've been talking all the time, so I just have to make some break. So we're just expecting to see what would you come up with in this position. Okay. Uh, so let's go. What would you do in this position? <clears throat> chest team hello chest team I haven't seen you try and push queen side pawn majority well you can do that but I'm not entirely sure that it could be the best idea uh, Mr. Cuddles says C takes D and then advance the E pawn it takes D makes sense. 
But do you really think that Carpa would go for E4 afterwards? A, you're, and by the way, just use the logic. We're talking about the isolated pawn. So the rest of the game, you just have to play like this. Ugly as, I'm not supposed to say the rest of the name. Yeah, create an IQP. Okay, the Thousand Master said the same. So all of you guys, or most of you said C takes D5. Exactly. C takes D5, E takes D5. Please not disappoint me. We're not fighting, you know, now when you, you, when you played all these moves, managing to create an isolated pawn, now you definitely don't want to play E4 and getting your <clears throat> opponent rid of this weakness. So now the knight went back to F3, controlling both D4 and E5. I opted for this game because I find a great similarity between this game and Botwinnik's game. I'm even pretty sure that Botwinnik, when, you know, when he taught Karpov how to play against isolated pawn, he showed him his game and many of previously seen things from previously seen game, Karpov uh, applied in this one. So, this is a great example to world champions, to one of the best positional players, just went for pretty much the same plan. Uh, I'm absolutely sure you're going to remember this and you're going to like this so much. So, let's go. Uh, after knight to f3, he is fixing the d5 pawn and this is like clearly clearly big wick after knight f3 h6 he's avoiding even some tactics this knight he he assumed that sometimes karpov even threatened some knight g5 followed by knight d5 so played h6 and here we go uh, here's what karpov said after the game and uh, said how is white supposed to play this position the task of the white is to exchange at least one pair of the knights. When he exchange pair of the knights, black is going to have a uh, less number of minor pieces. Less number of minor pieces in positions like this means worse protection of the d5 pawn. And worse protection of the d5 pawn means you're going to be able uh, to attack the d5 isolated pawn stronger. Uh, also, he says which knight should be uh, exchanged. Of course, it should be the knight on f3. It should be traded off for the knight on c6. And how? Playing the knight d4 or playing the knight e5? That's another question. And finally, once you jump by the, this knight, either on e5 or d4, you're going to do what? You're going to free the f3 square for the bishop to come there to attack and once again exert pressure like in previous. So let's go. Uh, by the way, find the similarity between the previous game. Uh, Botwinnik's opponent also uh, played h6. And here, just like in Botwinnik's game, Karpov is doing the knight e5. He's not going to play knight d4. Because knight e5 is doing more. It's attacking both knight on c6 and the bishop on d7. It keeps the rook open on d1, uh, keeping, an, keeping the attack and the pressure on the d5 pawn. And freeing the f3 square against the d5 pawn. And, you know, he's, he's just able to place this bishop on f3. And with the knight, on e5 with the bishop on f3 with the rook on d1 uh, with the knight on c3 the one we shouldn't forget as well uh, it's very difficult for black to defend this d5 pawn the rest of the game uh, okay uh, so after like knight to e5 followed by bishop e3 this guy played bishop e6 but guys Harpov is fulfilling his job is now taking on c6. It's a very nice moment of the game. I'd like to point this out because black is forced to take by rook. Somebody asked me once when I analyzed this game, 
with some of my students, why not beat a c6? Because now you're going to see the power of these bishops. You're going to see the power of these bishops. And you're going to see how bad is this rook. Uh, please remember this trick. It happens and occurs very often in a blitz game. This is nice. So he had to take by rook on c6. Uh, by the way, do you remember what Karpov said about this position? He said that uh, plan by white should be to exchange the pair of the knights. And the position is getting a lot easier because now the d4, d5 pawn is not supported anymore by the knight on c6. So no d4 ideas will be possible here. Please have a look at this bishop on f4 as well. This bishop on f4 is going to go to e5, doing two things, uh, going against the knight on f6, controlling d4, blocking this pawn, and exerting pressure once again against the d5 pawn as soon as you play bishop to f3. Fantastic plan, uh, fantastic game so far, and the real, real things are just coming. So after rook c6, Harpov is playing bishop f3, queen to b6, and uh, you know, uh, he's also freeing the d8 square. He wants to play rook d8, supporting the d5. Uh, but look what white is doing bishop e5. He is fixing the d5 pawn, saying, no, you won't be able to, dish, to push this pawn uh, until the end of the game. By the way, guys, watch out. Sometimes, not now. Sometimes I'm just saying not now because uh, even rook can take there. D4 is an idea. D4 followed by bishop b3. But of course, here that's not an idea first because the rook on c6 is hanging. Even though it wasn't hanging, d4 is not possible because a rook takes d4. But I'm just saying that definitely uh, uh, stands there as an option. Anyways, uh, after after bishop to e5, is fixing the d4 square and stopping the d4 by black at any point. Uh, black played knight to e2, knight to e4. Black is trying to uh, trade off, uh, he's trying to pressure the knight on c3 and he's trying to take advantage of the queen on c2. Trying to do something with a c file basically. Uh, white plays queen to e2. White plays queen e2, he's avoiding this pin, uh, and now bishop on e5 turns out to be one of decisive pieces because he's just controlling there. Uh, after queen e2, knight c3, bishop c3, rook to d8, and after rook to d8, uh, somebody, somebody uh, could wonder what if this, because the c3 is hanging, nothing. Then you take on g7, and uh, we're just weakening the king's side and the black's king. This is why they play rook to d8. And after rook to d8, it's white's turn. Once again, I'd like to give you time to come up with plan for white. In the meantime, let me see what is happening in the chat room. Future bishop second, c6, somebody said. Uh, Boran Banjan discovery on the C file. I guess you've been talking about some different type of positions. Are pawns considered important? Said Mike Lopping. Of course they are. Every pawn can become a queen. Uh, but in, in life, things are not working like this. Uh, okay, pawns win games, mate. Okay. Let's have a look. What are you going to what are you going to suggest in this position for white? As usual, exchange a tone of pieces and control d4 and then expose the weakness of the d4 iso, d5 isolated pawn. Says ugly as fuck. Uh, Alier 17 said bishop to d4. Bacon DMC 23 said again rook d rook d2 doubling up. Broken eagle, every pawn can become a queen. Yeah, but in life, it's not like this. Uh, pressure d4 pawn. Uh, okay. 
pressured the center. Eric Hansen, do you have solution to this position? Uh, ah. Warren Banjan, my mom told me I can become a queen when I grow up. We believe so. We hope that our streamer on, on, on Chess Bride is going to become a queen one day. Wow, that's a good thing. Uh, let's go. This, all of you said bishop to d4. It's not like with the knight. You don't, you don't have to place your knight on d4. Uh, just putting and placing your knight to be there and just to do a blockade. Bishop on c3 is good enough. It's blocking the d5 pawn until the rest of the game. Wow. g3, rb3 said king to h1. What the hell? <laughs> trade more pieces. Mr. Cutlass. Well, how, how are you going to trade more pieces? Just give me some ideas. In life, you don't need to work hard to rise the ranks to reality. You're either born into it or you're not. Those bad men. Oh, just him. Somebody's trying and coming up with some. Oh, please, I have to read this and I have to think of, about this. Uh, too dumb to, to get this at first. Uh, final top chess, rook to d3. Why would you place and why would you put your rook to d3, to d3 please? Why would you do so? I'm just interested to hear because some people said bishop d4, somebody said rook to d3, somebody rook to d2, somebody said, uh, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Would any one of you consider move e4? I'm just interested in this. Would any one of you consider e4 for white? I'm just interested to see uh, how you think in this situation. Boran Banjan uh, said a rook to d4, but then bishop f6 and uh, bishop on c3 is going to fall and they're going to create an isolated pawn on a3 and c3 and that's just bad so rook to d4 doesn't work in the view of bishop f6 because once you move your rook but maybe you can play rook to b4 aha uh -huh, it works it does work it does work yeah yes can i ask you a question and nobody says anything uh i, I just ask you would you play e4 nobody answered me uh, only if wins tactically. Nimzo Bo is fully right. So you should never, actually, in your games, you should consider moves like e4, but in this specific situation, not because it doesn't win tactically. So you just keep holding this d5 pawn there and, you know, just blocked over the d4 square. That's good. That's good. I just wanted to see if you're thinking the right way. That's a good thing. Anyways, after like rook to d8, rook to d3 was the move, doubling up the rooks. I see so many similar things in this game with Botwinik's game. Rook c d6, rook f to d1, and rook 6 to d7, and rook 1 to d2, an amazing maneuvering by Karpov because he wants to triple up his pieces and the best way to triple your pieces is to put your queen from behind and to support your rooks. So this is very nice idea. Rook d1, rook d2, queen d1 behind these two rooks and this is such a strong idea, such a strong plan and I like it a lot. Okay, when you triple your pieces like this and your heavy pieces like this, this is very, very dangerous for them because sometimes you can even consider playing some e4 ideas. At the moment, our main problem is this bishop on, G on e6 because this bishop on e6 is probably the, the best defender of the d5 pawn. So queen d1. Let's have a look at this position. Uh, after queen b5, he plays the queen d1. I'm, I, I'd stop here, definitely. Uh, pointing out how strong 
these rooks and these heavy pieces are along the D file. How weak is the D5 pawn? But I'm having once again a question for you. Is this enough? Is this enough? And uh, what are you supposed to do in position like this? So please, I'm asking you, according to Sherashevsky, there is extremely important, almost necessary role if you want to win a game like this. Can you win a game playing against one weakness? Hard. Because one weakness could be easily, or just hardly, but it could be defended. So, what are you supposed to do? Please, what are you going to say here? And who could actually tell me what should White do in this situation? Exactly. Hari Shiva is coming up with the correct plan. We need a second weakness. So we need to create, according to Sherashevsky, second witness. Sherashevsky was a chess player, and he was a chess writer, who wrote two fantastic books. Both were in Russian. I don't know if you could get those books in English, but those are just amazing books. And they're helping every medium chess player to understand uh, the nature of uh, middle games and just very, very important aspect of positional uh, play. Uh, so look at this one. You won't be able to win this game if you, if you don't create a second weakness. Uh, let's go now. Principle of two weaknesses. Find a plan. For example, this is quite difficult position even for, for example, for Eric Hansen uh, or Aman Hamilton. Uh, or our complete chess breath team, including Lafon, including Robin Van Kempen. Uh, why? Uh, because maybe when I tell you now that you have to create a second witness, it's not that difficult. But during the game, uh, to be able to find and to come up with this one, it's not so easy. For example, for me, this is like Cosmos. So after Queen D1, Black plays B6. Just like in previous uh, game, like in Botwinik's game, uh, Black also plays b6. Uh, b6, prophylaxis, not to have sometimes this pawn on b7 uh, be hanging. So after, uh, after uh, this b6 move, uh, White should, should come up with plan here. Fantastic idea. I like it so much. And this was one of the crucial moments of this game. I surely think uh, I surely think this was the decisive moment of the game. Let me have a look. Ugly as fuck a4. Boran Banjan rip to d4. Amadan says queen to b3. You're not serious, man. Queen to b3, you're hanging a queen. Uh, my clopping, this one is easy. Uh, spinal tap chess said g3, put the bishop back and play h4 followed by queen h5 type of ideas. Uh, I really have to say, I really have to say that I'm amazed with the plan that spinal tap came up with. Uh, he said, put the, play the g3, put the bishop back and find place for the queen. That's exactly what happened. Fantastic plan, so profound. I find it extremely difficult. And surely I would have lots of problems during the game, even if the position was set to me like this and say, like, find and create a plan of the second witness. I would have so many problems. So after g3, bishop f8, bishop g2, bishop e7, and queen h5. I'd just like to point out one thing. I know that this topic is not as popular and is not as interesting as previous lesson where I taught you how to attack with IQP. Uh, but it's ex of extreme importance for all of you who just want to play, who just want to play uh, strong chess. So uh, let's go, Amadan, please don't come up with a move like Queen B3 in that position. Anyways, Queen H5, A6. And he now plays h3. 
uh, another extremely difficult move, another move of, um, you know, such, such a hard to understand this one. He's trying to find shelter for his king and to put it somewhere on H2, being there, being like better protected, not being on the back rank. Ex move of extreme difficulty, I'll be honest with you. So after H3, queen C6, king H2. But for example, when you now compare Botwinik's game with Karpov's game, we see a lot of similarities. Uh, a lot of similarities, and this is really, really uh, nice. But it's also weird how how similar they were each to other. And for example, imagine this one. This guy was also coaching Kasparov, and Kasparov is completely opposite type of a. Team. That's interesting. Anyways, after uh, H3 and King H2, in the game was. A5, and now Karpov is slowly but surely pushing the pawns. When all of you thought that uh, he would come up with something similar to Botwinik, rook to d4, and uh, doing those stuff with straight g4 and g5 without any of these pawn moves, now he's proving completely different. Uh, that he just wants to do the pawn storm on the king's side, and he wants to once again take advantage of the move h6, just what the previous guy uh, Botwinik did in his game. Very nice and very very difficult to understand. Anyways, uh, after after uh, f4. In the game was f6. Uh, this is more or less forced kind of weakening of his position because white was just threatening the f5 to win this bishop. So uh, in case he played f5 himself, queen goes to g6, threatening checkmate, bishop f8 the only move, and now bishop e5 followed by g4 and g5, weakening this position to the maximum and coming up with so many tactical threats all of a sudden. Although the guy didn't play f5, he played f6. And after f6, queen to d1. Once again, Karpov is going back with his queen. Once again, he's placing the queen on the ideal square behind these two rooks. And uh, he's going after the d5 pawn. Such a deep chess. So, queen b5. Uh, now he was threatening maybe Amadan's queen to b3, but in some of these situations, after queen to d1, queen to b5, he's doing the g4. Uh, when black played g5, he's now playing prophylactic king to h1. He's moving the queen from some bishop d6 idea and some checks. So after queen c6, f5. I'm just going a little bit faster uh, throughout this part of the game. But what he did here, he moved this bishop. Please, please, guys, have a look at this one. He moved this bishop from e6, which was, do you remember, like five minutes ago when I said that the bishop on e6 is probably the best defender of the black's position? Because it was keep holding the control of the d5 pawn and also keep defending the, the bishop on d7. Look what happened. Harpa pushed the pawn up to f5, and all of a sudden, he played e4. Watch out now. The king is not on h2. So there are no more checks. There are no more chances for this guy to do anything uh, against that king. And furthermore, he plays e4 and points out that the bishop on e6 was a great defender of the d7 rook. And now this rook is under the attack. So difficult. So difficult. So good. Uh, this is so, so, so deep. I like it really a lot. So after uh, e4, in g7, he takes d5, queen c7. Uh, now I can ask you, uh, this is a very basic question to all of you, but you just have to answer it to me. Now you're up a pawn. What are you supposed to do now? 
So when you're up a pawn, what are you supposed to do? Absolutely. When you're up a pawn, you're supposed to trade off pieces. Why? Uh, because as more pieces as you exchange, the easier end game you're going to get, and uh, it's going to be very, very uh, simple to realize that type of position. I'm red band high chess people. Hello, red band. Hello, D4. Uh, hello, Peter94. Uh, trade, 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 trade. Everybody said trade. Uh, thank you so much for participating actively in this lesson. I see that you're listening to me very carefully. So after he takes d7, queen c7, rook, oops, rook to e2 was in the game, sorry, b5. Uh, I usually explain to all my students, after such a great deep and profound tactics, very, uh, sorry, uh, strategy, very easy tactics. And here, he just took an e7 and do this fork with the d6. After d6, uh, Spassky played queen c4. He's, he can't take on e7 because the d3 rook is hanging, but he just played b3. And right now, uh, he was ready to take because if the queen moves somewhere, he can take and he's up a piece. If he takes on b3, he would take. Bishop takes. And after he takes, now he can promote the queen, and there is no more bishop on f7 to keep controlling the e8 promoting square. How did you like this game? That was such an amazing game. It was so deep, and uh, for a long time, including the previous Lucien Botwinix game, I haven't seen such a great examples uh, against the IQP and how is one supposed to play. I hope you like the game. Hope you 